was a terrifying experience, you know. I imagine uh, the most shook up one was probably Steve. He was only like 17. I think he actually lied about his age to get the job out there. Yeah, I was 17, so I was, I was the kid. I thought we was going to go to jail for murder. There was times I was saying we need to go back. There was times I was saying we need to go get help. You know, I mean, it went back. Everybody was going back and forth, you know, in their own minds and between each other. When we got back there and we looked around the area and we couldn't find Travis, that's when it hit Mike. Mike and Travis were best buddies then, you know, and stuff. And, and I think he felt really bad about taking off and leaving him like that. It was pretty hectic and uh, it was very emotional at that point. You know, your mind just, just takes off. We came off the mountain after we was looking for Travis and we couldn't find him. And we pulled in there and Kenny got out and called the sheriff's department. It didn't come directly to me, it came to a, a deputy sheriff in Heber who called me on the phone and then he gave me a little more detail on it. When I arrived there, there were six young men. They were just stomping around and a couple of them were, were crying. And I tried to get just as close to each one of them as I could to see if I could detect odors of marijuana or alcohol or anything like that. He says that he didn't believe us or disbelieve us. You know, he was going to be neutral. But before we went up on the hill to radio, for him to radio the sheriff, we better be certain because we could get in a lot of trouble. Travis Walton was just 22 years old when this happened, and he was in this tiny little town of Snowflake, Arizona. This little town that was founded by Mormons. Everyone knew everyone in Snowflake. So it's not just like he's just in, in New York City or some other big town where he's anonymous. The question is, what the hell happened to this young man? How is it that he could just disappear? We're a rough looking bunch then, you know, and. Uh... A bunch of us out there with chainsaws and that, and some conflicts here and there, you know. So they um, they just immediately started assuming, well, they killed this guy, you know, because they weren't gonna believe that wild story we were telling them. The police, and no one can blame them, had to look at the much more obvious real-world possibility that these hardworking, tough, blue-collar guys, even though they were friends, there was a falling out, there was a fight, an argument, and one way or another, um, Travis lost his life. The body was hidden. When we went to search the next day, they split us up. They had a deputy with each group. And the whole time, the deputies asked me, you know, and telling me, well, if you just tell us where the body is, and what you did with Travis, we can all go home and get this over with. I think we had made contact with the, uh, the dog handler from Arizona State Prison. He came on site and started from the point where it had been pointed out as where the incident occurred. The days proceeded on and, and the helicopter went around and uh, people expanded and expanded and we never found a footprint or a sign anywhere of Travis Walton. They, they took me first and I was scared to death. I figured I was gonna, I was gonna flunk it no matter what. I didn't wanna come here. I tried to sneak out the back door of the day of the polygraph test because all week long I've been hearing, well, they're gonna set it up to make you guys look guilty and y'all ain't never gonna come out of that jailhouse. We couldn't get out. You know, we weren't, it was like being under arrest, but they didn't just say we were, you know, but it wasn't no different. We weren't leaving, nobody was going anywhere, you know, until it was completely done. The polygraph is not perfect. It's in fact, one of the most awful tests that anyone would have to take. Um, you're strapped in with tubes around your chest and you've got wires connected to you. And I, I've taken multiple polygraphs and I wouldn't wish that on anyone. I designed the questions. Uh, the entire test is established by research from uh, Dr. Raskin at the University of Utah, who done many, many years of research on its validity and its accuracy. It took about two hours, and it was like four questions over and over and over. Did you murder Travis Walton? No. Did you see 
what seemed to be a flying saucer? Yes. Did you see the object hit him with a beam of light? Yes. We could have refused to take the test. You know, we didn't have to take it, but you know, we wanted to to get the, you know, get the truth out. And I passed it at 95%, I think, or something like that. They all passed that test. Most people still didn't believe it, you know. The Sheriff Gillespie definitely didn't believe it. I think that they all were trying to tell the truth about everything. And then what happens? Travis returns. Five days growth of beard, lost about 10 pounds of weight, and the frenzy begins. Okay, now could you take us back to this morning when you, this, some of whoever it was that first got word that he was back? Okay, uh, what happened was that Grant Neff, which is my brother-in-law, he got a telephone call. Uh-huh. He answered, Grant, he said, this is Travis, I'm back, I need help. And he says, wait a minute, fella, he says, you got the wrong number, I'm sorry. And he says, don't hang up on me, Grant. He says, this is Travis. He says, I need help bad. He asked him where he was at, and he said he was in a telephone booth out by the Enco station in Heber. I just looked at my mom and says, I told you we didn't kill him. When I did hear that Travis had been returned, it was almost as unbelievable as the real thing. Travis was my best friend. And it was Dwayne that picked up Travis? Yes, which is the closest one to him anyway, out of all the brothers. OK. He yeah. said that when he reached uh, in the booth to grab Travis, he said Travis start scooting away from him, kind of get away from him. He reached down, picked him up, and held him in his arms. So just like grabbing a baby, he just cuddled right up and started crying. They weighed him, he lost 12 pounds, said he hadn't eaten in five days. He was in terrible shape. I was trying to tell him what had happened, you know, just trying to get it out. And it was, it was such a, it was just too traumatic. I was just, you know, it was all broke up. He said something about how concerned my mother had been in those days. And I didn't understand. It was, became apparent in the exchange there that I was thinking this was still the same night. And he said, Travis, feel your face. And I reached up and felt that I had a five-day growth of beard. And, you know, that came as a, 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 really a terrible shock. Travis Walton reappeared after several days with a bizarre story about a ride in an unidentified flying object. But it's been basically a second-hand story. Travis has been in hiding and has not met with the media. Consequently, there have been a lot of questions about the truthfulness of what Travis has had to say. I didn't know he was back until that following night. My mom said someone came by and said Travis is back, but he's in a, tu he's in a Tucson hospital. I really uh, kind of went catatonic for a little bit there. Went back, had a very emotional uh, reunion with my mother, and it was uh, it just tears my heart to even you know think to this day you know that uh, what she was going through. Have you had much uh, communication with the news media on this? Uh, yes, they've been in and out all the time. Uh -huh. They're trying to corner mom. We're trying to keep mom away from them. We've even got some coops in here now that's coming in and out to see the freak show, as they call it. Everyone descends, not just uh, your local UFO groups, UFO researchers. Sure, they were there. But on top of that, you have media. You have the National Enquirer, you know, the great tabloid rag that was covering things like this. The first night, I laid down in bed and the phone rang. It did not stop till daylight or after. I literally sometimes would be on two telephones at the same time, because I had phone calls from all over the world. I was called by Canada. I was called by England. I was called by Japan. I was called by Russia. I was called by several Asian countries. I was called, call, 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 all night long. We did an interview at the headquarters sometime later with the news crew there. They asked some questions regarding the test and the results and so on. Basically, we all told them, told them the same thing, that we're investigating and and didn't have any final results. The media scrutiny was so intense. Uh, once it was even suspected that when my brother was involved, the reporters were knocking on the door there constantly. When we went to leave the hospital, and somebody yelled out, there he is, and they chased us in through traffic. Travis, why, did you, why didn't you bring your story to the media? Well, my family 
uh, told me about the, the news people and all the people that were crowding around, and I was just in no condition to to talk to anybody, especially the, you know a mob of, of people like that. I couldn't just couldn't handle it. Plus the warnings that uh, that my brother had and my family had from from various quarters that it was a dangerous situation as to who might get a hold of him. Not necessarily that the sheriff's department would, would be involved in any sort of foul play or underhanded attempt, but what if they were to hand me over to some government agency and to heck with uh, what damage that might do to me, you know, if they were after information or certain things that they considered important. Does he uh, remember uh, what this thing looked like? The craft? Yeah, yes. We were working on the Mogollon Rim in the Sitgreaves National Forest, which is the largest ponderosa pine forest in the world. It stretches all the way from south of the Grand Canyon clear into New Mexico. There's a, a much of it that's relatively untouched because it was, uh, you know, one of the last frontiers. I was the, the crew boss. It was my contract, and I hired Travis and several other guys. Travis had been working for me for practically 10 years already. It was gratifying because we were actually, you know, improving the forest. And it was called timber stand improvement to remove damaged and dead trees and, and clear out certain overgrowth to limit the fire danger and protect the forest. When we weren't working, you know, the beauty of the surroundings was just something that just has an effect that, uh, you know, it's really just hard to describe. You have to be there to to appreciate the freshness of the wilderness and being in touch with uh, nature, the animals, the trees. At times on your breaks and that, it was like sitting out here right now, just relaxing out in the woods, you know, where it's beautiful and that, you know, it was, it was a great job. It was early November, pretty cold, but it would warm up pretty quickly once the sun came up, and but not too much so that, you know, you, you didn't overheat getting work done. I don't remember doing it, but Mike says that I called in sick that morning and. He had to do some talking to get me to go work with him. Come pretty close to missing out on an experience like that. Well, we're always a little behind on the contract. You know, you just get out there and really bust your butt for a couple of days and you get caught back up. That day, you know, we were a little behind, so we worked until it was starting to get dark. We loaded up the equipment and uh, put it in the truck and headed out of there. And uh, hadn't driven very far when we uh, caught uh, glimmers of this glow coming through the trees. I first thought it was the moon, you know, and then as we're driving along, I'm looking over here and I can see the moon over here. Definitely something out of the ordinary, you know, you don't normally see any light at all out in the woods at night. I'd spent time in the, you know, I was on an aircraft carrier and that, you know, and uh, I'd been around a lot of aircraft and that. Somebody was saying, well, maybe it's a plane crash, but I'm looking at it, you know, and it's, it's not a plane crash. Could be headlights shining up at an angle, maybe a, a, a campfire or lights in a tent, something, but that just wasn't kind of uh, fitting in with the lay of the land. It's kind of like light shining through a lampshade. Basically why it was kind of yellowish glow to it. I mean, that's what it appeared to me. I urged Mike to hurry up and get up there to where the, uh, uh, light was breaking through the trees. There seemed to be sort of an opening through the trees that was letting some of the light shine across the road ahead. And when we broke into the clearing, there it was. This thing was uh, setting about 15 and 25 feet off the ground. It had uh, some kind of a round thing on top like a dome. Basically, it was just very, very sleek, you know. God, it was, it was just absolutely beautiful. As soon as Mike did stop the, the truck, you know, I was throwing open the door and uh, hurrying towards it, thinking it would just take off almost immediately. Travis had the door open before we even stopped. He was, he was you know, I don't know why. <laughs> I'm asking him about that. I said, what were you thinking? I was really, you know, immediately had a, a, a greatly growing fear that I had made a foolish move. But I, I didn't want to betray that to the rest of the guys, and so I, I kept going, but, you know, at a slower rate. As he got closer, I heard the sound, and it was like a, a beep. There was a high-pitched alternating frequency that carried real well, but the closer I got, the more subtleties I could hear to the sound. Parts of it that seemed to be at the edge of the, the range of human hearing, 
uh, on the high end and also in the low end where you were actually feeling the sound rather than just hearing it with the ear. When my hands were on the steering wheel, I could feel it, and uh, my elbow was on the window, I could feel it through that. It did get a little scary after a while because it, it started getting uh, more intense, louder, more volume. I jumped into a crouch, which was kind of like down and forward, which brought me that much closer to the crowd so that when I stood up to run back to the truck, that's what brought my body into the closest uh, proximity to the surface of that craft. Turn my head the other way, and then the woods all lit up a bluish green light. And when I look back, he's a few feet off the ground, and he's stretched out like this. I mean, it wasn't like he had a, a muscle at all, you know, he just, or bones. He just crumpled up right there. I thought he was dead. And that's when Mike started the truck up and took off. We drove down the road maybe a quarter mile, half mile, at, you know, from the craft. And you could see vehicles, you know, every once in a while going down that road. Well, you knew it was hunters with guns. Uh, my thought at first was, well, let's go get some of those. A lot of us were saying to go back in that, and a lot of us say, you know, at the same time saying, let's go get help, you know, but it was Mike's decision. Finally, I just said, I'm going back, you know, you can stay here or, or you know, get in the truck. And I was surprised that they all got in the truck. I think we had one flashlight, and he had the headlights of the vehicle shining up in that clearing on that slash pile. We walked around the perimeter with a flashlight and all in a line, one right behind the other. Once they couldn't find me and, you know, I, my body wasn't laying where I'd hit the ground, they just figured they needed to go and get help. He spent five days on the UFO, uh, he thinks. Now, there is some small time loss in there, but uh, for all intent and purposes, he spent five days on there. He did come in contact with some beings that are human-like, but they weren't human. Obviously, Duane, you know your own brother probably better than anybody else. Uh, do you believe the story? I've never seen him play a practical joke in his adult life. The police up here said that if it's a hoax, they're going to go ahead and put all kinds of charges against him. Uh-huh. And uh, that's the only thing that's involved in it right now. I see. The only threats I got were like... Uh, verbal harassment as I'm walking down the street or something, you know, you know, somebody yell out, hey, you know, we know what you did, or saying we're stoned on drugs. And there was uh, some government people, I'm sure they were government, because they used to drive them old Plymouth cars that, you know, they'd be the ugliest colored, uh, and the rims always matched, and two guys sitting there in suits. I'd see them fall for about the first couple of weeks, just about every time I went out the door. And they're going to run him through this uh, polygraph, too? Right. Polygraph, I see. ESA, and... and progressive hypnosis, and they said possibly sodium pentothal. Well, they're going to give him the works then, aren't they? He was scheduled to take an examination with me at our office in Phoenix at the time, and uh, he never showed up for it. But I think it's more Duane's influence rather than his that he didn't show up. Why not the polygraph test? This has been a major criticism. A lot of people have criticized it because they think polygraph is a lie detector, because it's called that, but it's not. And Travis was under that impression, too. He was anxious to take a uh, lie detector or polygraph test. I advised him not to, and several other people advised him not to, because what it actually measures is stress. And questions about stressful memories would bring stress reactions just as well as anything else. They didn't even have the term post-traumatic stress disorder in those days, you know. In those days, they called it uh, shell-shocked, or uh, there was other words for it uh, related to wartime tra trauma. One of the psychiatrists said it would have been a disaster for him to take it at the time. It would have created a lot of false impressions. This. Um, led to a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of uh, bad feeling that the sheriff couldn't understand the fragile condition I was in. To him, you know, my top priority should be, you know, get out there and take a lie detector test. I was just so, it's a fragile condition that my brother made all these decisions. I didn't even talk to him or discuss these things with him, tell him what I wanted, whether I would do this interview or do that or anything. I was, you know, not in that kind of shape. He had to process all of this. And, um, and that's the hard thing to do, because even though he was gone for five days, he only remembered about two hours worth of his time. And you'd have to ask yourself, well, why didn't he remember more? After the event made publicity in Arizona, 
It turns out that there was a nationally known UFO organization in Tucson called the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization, or APRO. They reached out to Travis and uh, arranged for hypnosis to be done by Dr. James Harder. And he was a skilled investigator uh, with engineering background as well as with uh, hypnotic techniques. He did a regression on me in which I was able to recount the memories for the first time uh, in their entirety without so much of the fear that was just keeping me from even speaking with, with, without breaking down. I talked to Dr. James Harder not long after he interviewed Travis and worked on that case. And Dr. Harder stressed the psychological impact that this had upon Travis. He was terrified. When I regained consciousness, I was looking up at a light shining down on me from the ceiling. I, I believed that, that I was in the hospital. I, I didn't make any attempt to move because of the pain I was in. My, I couldn't focus my eyes very well, but I, I looked beyond the, the top edge of the thing that was laying across me, and I saw two men le leaning over me. They had kind of underdeveloped features and uh, no hair of any kind. I didn't even think. I just lashed out, and uh, I grabbed up uh, a, a tube, a clear piece of glass or something, and I, I tried to break off the end to get something sharp to, to defend myself with, but they didn't try to approach or, or anything. They just left. They just ran out real fast. There was a corridor outside, and they went to the right, and I went to the left. It was a very narrow corridor and it was dimly lit everywhere. I went into this room that you could even see the stars back through the wall I just came through. And there was nothing in the room but a chair with some controls and knobs and things. I heard somebody come in and I turned around and it was a man. He, he wasn't like the other uh, creatures or whatever at all. He, he looked just like you and I, except he had a helmet on us. So I started babbling questions to him, and I ran over there, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't answer me. He just took me by the arm and, and wanted me to go with him. I thought, he, maybe he can't hear me through the helmet. We went out to the door. It was a large room. There was, there was two uh, other UFO-looking things. that looked like flying saucers, kind of, except they were rounded uh, an oval shape and they're really shining like uh, chrome. I was let down the hallway and in a room with three other people that were like himself. I sat in the chair and I tried to get the people to talk to me that were there and they didn't have things on their head and, and so I thought that maybe they could hear me but they, they wouldn't answer either. They put a, a deal over my face. It was kind of like an oxygen mask thing. It was kind of clear plastic. I looked up at the ceiling, which was just, it was all solid light. There wasn't any light fixed or anything. And that was the last I remembered. I, I went to sleep until I woke up. I was laying on the pavement. I looked up, up the roadway. It was night, and I could see a light on the bottom of a, of a flying saucer, and it just went straight up really fast. Just without a sound. I recognized the roadway and I could see a light down the hill so I ran down that way down to the phone booth by the gas station there. I called my brother-in-law. That's the way it happened. What happened to Travis after we took off in that truck. I can't tell you, you know, I, I wasn't there. I don't know, but I believe every word Travis said about it. You know, I don't have any doubt in my mind because I say he, he's never lied to me about nothing. That procedure was actually quite a, a major step in the reduction of stress that I was feeling 
uh, I say reduction, but you know, it was at a, just um, at dangerous levels for months after, afterwards. We know that it's possible to confabulate under hypnosis, uh, but it's very important for the hypnotist to put in safeguards to prevent that from happening. Uh, and James Harder, Dr. James Harder, was very skilled at doing hypnosis. The session was taped. It was observed by two psychiatrists, uh, three actually, a whole team of reporters, other researchers, my brother. There was quite a few people present. You know, everything was properly conducted. There's no reason really to believe that it did not occur the way he recalled it. He had a lot of conscious recall of what had occurred and he just filled in some of the details. You have listened to the description that he gave us of his ordeal. What are your comments, your reactions in comparison with past cases? Well, I was uh, struck by the fact that he described uh, these beings that didn't look quite human. He described them precisely the way another uh, person has described them who had a similar experience. Now, this case has not been published anywhere, and no case like it that I know of has been published. So it's something that Travis could not have read anywhere. And the, the descriptions are identical. We have the core experience, and that is what is so important here. Not too long after the incident happened, uh, you know, many investigators, uh, other than the Aero Phenomena Research Organization, uh, most notably uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, a, a number of other people who were very active in the field at the time who have either passed away or, or retired from the field. But uh, one a person really comes to mind was uh, Stanton Friedman, a nuclear physicist who, uh, you know, takes a very scientific approach to investigation of such things. My focus is on facts and data and evidence, not on sensationalism. And I haven't had a case my, citing myself, so I'm not talking about, look at me, look what I saw, look what I did. And I specialize in using archives and places like that. And I think that's important that as a nuclear physicist, I demonstrate that you can be scientific when dealing with something as kind of off the wall as flying saucers or off the sky. <laughs> Stan does his homework and he, uh, and he does his field work too. He came out there visited me in my home, spoke to the people involved, investigated the site. That's what I'm known for. I, I check on things, and I have what I call a big gray basket. Not black, not white, maybe. People want a yes or a no answer. You believe this or don't. I say, I don't know enough in many cases. If somebody tells you a story for two minutes and I'm supposed to make a judgment? No, that's not the way we nuclear physicists act. At least this one doesn't. The true watchdog of, of truth is someone who advocates objectivity, open-minded examination. You neither accept nor reject until all the evidence has been properly evaluated. And that's all the evidence, pro and con. No matter what your, your perception of something is, or your belief, or your opinion, or your speculation, uh, if you want to do the job right, just follow where the evidence takes you. And no matter where it leads you to, no matter what kind of an outcome or result, whether you like the outcome or not, you will always stay credible if you follow the evidence. The uniqueness of Travis's case is that there's certain aspects you don't see in many other cases. For one, there were several other people who saw him being zapped. It wasn't one man's testimony. The one witness cases with no physical evidence are, are pretty easy just to kind of put aside and say, well, I can't say either way. You've got one person telling me a story. Now, when you have seven people telling you the same story, and those seven people are all passing on the relevant questions in not just one paragraph, but multiple paragraphs, I don't know of another case. I do not know of any other UFO uh, type of a case that has that much empirical evidence in its favor, just solely based on the polygraph. Back in those early 70s, there were not too many polygraph examiners in the state of Arizona. And local law enforcement, small agencies, depended upon 
either Phoenix Police Department or Tucson to furnish that type of expertise. I was a police officer for a number of years, and uh, the, when the Department of Public Safety was instituted in 1968, uh, there were certain things that they were going to furnish in some scientific field, question documents and things like that, and polygraph. They tested several of us, and the outcome was that I uh, was number one on the list, and then I was sent to New York to a polygraph school in New York City. And this was in the fall of 1971 and I've been doing polygraphs ever since. Cy Gilson, who is opinion was pretty well known and respected as a polygraph examiner. Uh, we had used him on other matters, criminal matters and stuff, and always with good results. We had a meeting of the six crew members and the sheriff, Travis's older brother, I think his name was Dwayne, I believe, uh, in the chow hall at the jail. And they finally agreed that they would all submit to this exam. I did tell them briefly what it was like, what was going to be attached to their bodies and why, and gave them some kind of an idea of what they were going to go through during this test. They came in and talked to us. We got into an argument with them, you know. Some of us have been in trouble with the law before. I was more scared this day that we came to this courthouse than the day that I seen Travis get that. This was the most horrible day because we, I just knew that we weren't coming out of this. There was one young man, he was the youngest of the group, sat over sort of the side and didn't have much input or anything to say. And from past experience with interrogations and so on, Someone like that is more likely to admit that it's a, a sham or whatever. So he's the one I wanted to choose first, because if it was a sham, it would save a lot of time and effort on my part and everybody else. Steve was his first name, but I don't remember the last name. I always thought they just took Steve because he was young and, and the most scared. You know, I was the first one to take a photograph test because they thought I would crack. I usually can get a pretty good idea as I go through the exam to know whether or not the questions are profitable in the sense that he's responding to certain specific questions and then I would have a conclusive examination. And frankly, when I finished with him, I was quite surprised myself because he was passing the exam. And we were there until 10 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. And then the guy tried to walk out without letting us know anything. <laughs> I didn't like that, so I chased him down. And I, and I told him, you know, we, we, we have to know. I tested each one of them down the line, and they all come out on the positive side. They were being truthful to those relevant questions. Five of them passed. One of them is inconclusive merely because the person, of the person's general nervous tension. One young guy, I think he was a red-haired fellow, his name was Dallas, that's his last name. And he had been in some minor scrapes or something with the law prior to that. So he was a little bit dubious about taking the exam to start with. He did not cooperate with me at all. They have to cooperate in the sense that they have to sit still, uh, no movements, listen to the questions, one word answer, and so on. And he was doing anything he could to disrupt the tracings, which he did, and his test was inconclusive. As far as conclusive examinations of polygraphic of tests, the fact that uh, the five that I did test, and they all come out passing the exam in the way that they did, would probably eliminate to the most degree that there'd be one lying and get past me. That would be, I think, impossible in itself. One of the first polygraph examiners to review the case was Edward Gelb, uh, who in 1978 was president of the American Polygraph Association. He came to the conclusion that the possibility of five people telling the same story, passing a polygraph test, and not telling the truth would be a million to one. 
That's extremely important. There's a lot of controversy about lie detector tests. Some people uh, state that uh, an honest person can tell the truth and fail. Uh, a sociopath can lie and pass. But it would be extraordinarily difficult for five people initially to pass that test. Eventually, the sixth did take the test and pass. And Travis and his brother also passed lie detector test after lie detector test. If that's not sufficient evidence uh, concerning this UFO incident, what are we doing convicting people and condemning them to death on the basis of less testimony than that? If you only had the evidence of the, the polygraph, you, you still have the most well-documented case in UFO history. We also have the, the tree growth in the immediate vicinity. In the summer of 2014, we went back to the site to do a field survey. It's been so many years since the original incident that we really did not expect to find anything there. But while we were on the site, a discovery was made. The calculations show that these trees were producing wood fiber at 30 something times the rate they had in the previous 85 years. Other trees uh, exhibited the same kind of changes and the effect diminished the farther you got from that spot. Not only was there an extreme growth rate to some of these trees around the clearing, but it seems that there's also a directionality to them. I started checking stumps at the four corners of the compass and discovered that there was a swelling and a thickening of the growth rings in the direction that the craft had been and not on its opposite side. That was where the thickness of the rings were at the minimum. Travis and some of the, the original people who, who did the first surveys had posited that possibly the, the cell growth was caused by radiation. I took that a step further and, and did some digging to see if there's been any academic studies done on radiation and tree growth, and I found at least one or two related to the Chernobyl incident. A university out of Poland did a study in 1997 that found trees that were exposed to radiation after Chernobyl had grown up to three times in volume of accelerated growth as compared to previous years. Our field survey and finding this directionality and, and possible connection to radiation opened a whole lot of new doors that need to be explored. We're really hoping that we can get um, certain universities that, that are experts in, in tree ring growth involved in this to see if we can actually see if there is a connection. I think it's important for people to recognize, you know, the weight of evidence that these things do happen. If you go online and look for UFO reports, you will find in North America alone about 12,000 sightings a year. Now that doesn't mean they're all alien craft, obviously, but there's a lot going on every single day, every day, and people are seeing truly inexplicable things happening. I mean, how could you possibly believe that we're the only beings in this universe, you know? It's not, there's no way. We've come a long way in our understanding about the odds of life elsewhere. With, uh, what, 100 billion stars in the Milky Way? Conservatively, if there was only 10 planets per star, we're talking about 1,000 billion planets. Not all of which would be, you know, life-supporting, of course, but there's just enough believability, just enough numbers of reports to sort of nudge people in the direction of accepting that we're not alone. The public is becoming more aware and more accepting that there is life out there in the universe, in our galaxy, in fact, and that the, that life has traveled to our Earth. At the same time, I'm always careful to say that not everything that's reported is of this nature. You know, I think there, it is important to retain a degree of healthy skepticism. Now, I personally have seen at least three different objects that I can't explain uh, doing very unconventional maneuvers in the sky. Uh, does that make me a believer? Um, do people ask if I'm a skeptic? I don't like those terms because I think everyone should be skeptical. We need skeptics. We need intelligent people with a skeptical attitude about this because this is a strange field. But a debunker is someone who is out there to tear people's stories down, to ridicule people, uh, so that the people 
will either just go away and take their stories with them, or will will be forced into a situation where they'll 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 admit that they made it all up, even though they didn't. Four basic rules for UFO debunkers. And Travers has run into all of these. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. What the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell them. If you can't attack the data, this is particularly true in Travis's case, attack the people. And do your research by proclamation, investigation is too much trouble. You know, it's so funny because I, I've, I've gone on a lot of times with some debates with some of these debunkers and you're extraterrestrial, you say, I said, I didn't say it was extraterrestrial. I said, maybe it is, I don't know, how am I supposed to know? All I'm saying is that this is what people saw, this is what was reported, this is what the photographic evidence backs up, the radar evidence, whatever it is, whatever particular case it is, you can speculate all you want is to figure out what it was, we know what it wasn't. They begin with the idea that if it's unproven, that's the absolute equivalent of disproven. And, you know, if you think about it, that's pretty absurd. They know that UFOs aren't real. They absolutely know it is empirical fact. You know, how cool is that? They will reach and they will stretch and they will find anything that they think will make some kind of sense to somebody as a way of explaining. Their whole job is, we must explain this away. Certainly one of the most successful propagandist of the second half of the 20th century was Philip Glass. Uh, and his area of propagandizing was almost anything strange, but especially UFOs. He, uh, through the 50s and early 60s, had never read anything on the topic of UFOs. But he had already predetermined that anyone who believed that this had happened was a crank or a kook. Those were two of his favorite words. He sat in a very privileged position. He was senior avionics editor for Aviation Week and Space Technology based in Washington, D.C. So the go-to guy for any media people who needed anything. Klaus was a man who was extremely well connected. You know, years before the Travis Walton case, Klaus worked very hard to, to destroy the reputation of one of America's leading atmospheric uh, physicists, a man named James McDonald, who was a fearless, brilliant, tireless UFO investigator researcher. To kill the character of people if you couldn't attack their findings was something that Philip became very good at. I think Philip contributed directly to the suicide of Dr. James McDonald, one of the finest and most courageous scientists in the history of trying to get UFOs into the public mindset. Class also did the same thing with Stanton Friedman. I uh, discovered a letter in the archives, in the Canadian National Archives. When Friedman moved to Canada back in 1979, Class wrote a, a scandalously scathing, uh, libelous letter to the Canadian National Research Council trying to destroy Friedman's reputation there. He carried on what I would call a personal vendetta against Travis. Uh, he hadn't talked to any of the witnesses during that, or naturally not, that wasn't his style. There were some rather underhanded uh, tactics being employed, altering quotations to, make, to reverse the meaning of things that people said, and even misquote to make it seem that they were saying something they didn't. Philip Class did contact me and I took him out to the scene. We spent a day out there. He brought a Geiger counter out with him and we went to the scene and he checked it out. I received a f phone call from uh, Philip Glass and he told me who he was and what he was looking for and information and he started asking me questions. I had some input with regard to Mr. Glass beforehand so I asked him if he would just put all the questions and stuff in writing and send it to me. I'd be happy to answer his questions, but I never did receive any letters from him. Philip Class was extremely thorough in digging. I mean, he called uh, former employers, he, everything, uh, but he connected with anything. And here, I am the main person involved, never attempted to even phone me, never attempted to write a letter or anything. So there is no concern with truth or with people's reputations or anything like that. That's the way he was. And I say that I've met with him. We've even had some meals together. 
where we agreed not to talk about UFOs, frankly, but uh, most of the time. What the uh, crew did was get together and uh, sign a joint letter challenging Philip Class to a new polygraph test that the crew would take. And it would have to be an examiner that was mutually agreed upon so that, uh, that, the, that in the aftermath, when we passed, which we would, there could be no criticism that the, the evidence was tainted in any way. Now, he would pay for the, have to pay for the test if we passed. We would pay for them if we flunked. So he's got nothing to lose by accepting. He wound up basically in not really accepting it because he couldn't back it up. Phil's approach was very straightforward. You start with the assumption there can't be anything to flying saucers. So every case has a prosaic explanation, he claimed. He initially stated that Travis Walton must have been out in a cabin in the woods uh, and that when, he, when his brother took him to Phoenix for medical exams, the puncture wound on the backside of his elbow must have been an indication that Travis was injecting LSD. He knows that Travis didn't have the experience, therefore it must have been something else. And one of his pet theories was Travis and the other men who he was working with had a contract to log a certain amount of lumber over the course of the, a year. He settled in on the idea that Mike Rogers was in deep trouble with his contract and, and he had to invent this story in order to get out of it. And so they came up with this perfectly rational story of Travis being hit by a beam of light from a UFO and that's the excuse that they gave for trying to get out of the contract. That would uh, get us out of the contract and I'd get my 10% retention and everybody get paid and, and we can make it through the winter, see? It was, it was wrong on every count, every single count. I knew that they were having trouble with the, the contract. I knew that, it, but you see, I also know that doing some stunt like that is not gonna get you out of the contract. It just ain't. It was a hounding that went so far as to urge uh, a federal criminal investigator to come and try to force Mike <clears throat> to sign a confession. And Mike got written affidavits from the contracting officers from the Forest Service stating clearly that there's absolutely no way that Mike could have benefited and, and actually was harmed in many ways by this incident having happened. You know, just like Phil Class when he offered me the $10,000. That was a lot of money back in the 70s. Steve Pierce, who was the youngest member of the work crew that Travis Walton was on, stated that Philip Class offered him $10,000 in order to say that this was a hoax. $10,000 is a nice amount of money today. In 1980, that was a really nice chunk of money. And particularly if you're a young guy like Steve Pierce was at the time who was struggling financially, could have used the money. He flew, we discovered later, to Texas, track Steve down even though he was operating under uh, his middle name, Jeff, and uh, took him out to dinner and uh, expended a tremendous amount of uh, time and effort and money to try to persuade him to take the $10,000 bribe. Why would any normal citizen go through such, jumping through such hoops to get someone to debunk this case? Another thing to consider with class are the, the people that he consorted with. Uh, now, one of these was a, a man named Donald Menzel. Before there was class, Menzel was America's leading debunker of UFOs. Menzel was an astronomer at Harvard University. Doesn't get any better than that. A highly respected academic who wrote a number of books under the pose of, um, you know, a skeptical academic looking at UFOs as misinterpretations of natural phenomena and things. But there was a secret life to Donald Menzel also that nobody or very few people knew about. Donald Menzel was very well connected to the NSA. I had to get permission for three different people to look at Menzel's papers at Harvard and discovered to my total shock that he wrote Jack Kennedy, President Kennedy, whom we knew because Kennedy had been on the board of overseers at Harvard and his area of interest was astronomy. is one area where he may be able to provide special assistance and that has to do with the very special national security agency. And he tells Kennedy, when we are properly cleared to each other, I can tell you more 
which was one of those, what? <laughs> Back in the, in the 60s and 70s, the NSA was very much below the radar of this nation. Menzel's wife didn't even know that he was well-connected with the NSA. That's how secret this was. But Menzel and Klass had a very close correspondence. Back in the 70s, it suddenly turns out that the CIA is playing footsie with a lot of journalists. They would report to the CIA after attendance at a foreign conference uh, on a regular basis. Big names for major publications. And it was a big scandal at the time. And my feeling is that Phil was the perfect person to be used by the CIA. He wasn't married. He traveled a great deal to conferences. He had a legitimate job for a major publication, very well thought of, Aviation Week. And he could attend conferences and report back what Americans were saying they shouldn't have been saying, what Russians were saying that we'd like to know what they were saying. Class was able to get op-ed pieces in the New York Times, like, no big deal. He was able to get on major media uh, to talk about these cases. No big deal for him. Well, gee, when you think about how difficult that's, that is to do, you've got to be very well connected to do all of those things. And now that through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, I have come into possession of the FBI investigation of this guy, there's definite evidence that he probably was um, acting on behalf of some covert agency in attempting to discredit this. He identified himself to me as U.S. government UFO investigator. Philip Klaas, and, uh, and I think he was, you know. And he was the only U.S. government man that appeared on the scene. I don't believe that anyone turned him into a UFO skeptic, uh, but they certainly were in a position to guide and uh, they also finance his efforts. Here's our slush fund, here's $10,000, and you're gonna destroy this case for us. This is a classic mark of an intelligence community operation. Klaas stated, in letters that he did not have a very high income. So the money came from somewhere. I don't know if it was a federal agency, if it was a private individual, or what it was, but he was highly motivated. He was acting as though he had orders to, to kill this no matter what. You know, if you can't find a cheek in the armor, make one. <laughs> and that's what he did. Now let's go a step further. Why would the intelligence community want to debunk the Travis Walton case? It sounds like science fiction, but you know, you have to acknowledge it would be extremely disruptive for this kind of, you know, total uh, undeniable truth to be just delivered to the world tomorrow. People say to me, why doesn't the president or why doesn't our government admit that UFOs are from someplace else? Because they can't, because nobody in the government is willing to come out and say, yes, we're being visited and we're sorry that we lied to you about it and kept it from you for so many decades, but we felt that we were doing it for your benefit, to protect you, to protect the citizens until we knew more about it. Disinformation was a very important thing in winning World War II. It was aimed at Hitler and Japan, but we lied intentionally, often, powerfully. Uh, that's, that's the way the ball game is played. So what, what you find is that you have gatekeepers within the world of the media, you have gatekeepers in the world of academia, who their job, it's like sheepdogs guarding the flock. And that's also one of the reasons why I don't think that there will be disclosure in, in my lifetime. But so many people think, oh no, it wouldn't be that harmful, you know. They, now everybody they know would think this is great, you know, you know, full disclosure. But no, if you look around at the institutions, the financial, religious, social mores that are out there, it would be extremely destructive. I mean, people would not go to work tomorrow. The structure of energy, uh, finance, the whole thing would be turned on its head. I think every government in the world has three major problems along these lines with regard to UFOs. One, they'd like themselves to figure out how it works because it makes a great weapons delivery system. It makes anything worth flying look pretty naive by comparison. Two, you'd want to make sure that the other guy doesn't figure out how to duplicate their behavior because then you have a defense problem. If he's got something that flies like these things, we got a problem because we can't handle it. 
and three, perhaps most important, a kind of philosophical political problem. As soon as it becomes obvious to the people on the planet and widely accepted that flying saucers are real and from off the earth, there's going to be a push for a view of man as earthlings. The people on this planet, instead of I'm an American or Russian or Chinese, I'm an earthling. There is no government that wants its citizens to owe their primary allegiance to the planet as opposed to the country. Nobody wants to give up their power. And that's really how this system works. Now, there are a few brave people who are able to go beyond that. But if you're going to go beyond that, you've got to be brave and you've got to be prepared to fight. You've got to be prepared to have people like Philip J. Class go after you if you become too good at it. I hated Travis for a long time after this because my whole world just, it was just, it just tore up and um, people thought we were lying and thought we were crazy and why are you sticking up with Travis for all this time? You know this really didn't happen. It changed my life in a way. I'm kind of sorry about it. You know, I had to leave here, you know. I wasn't gonna, I can't stand there and have somebody call me a liar. People were desperate to explain it away. And some of it was just very simply fear-based, you know. People in the community wanted reassurance this can't happen, can it? It's a really strong religious community. And this just kind of messed up their whole program, you know what I mean? Their way of thinking about it. My mom still don't believe it. She thinks this is all from the devil. And you think about how significant it is in our society. The most important thing that ever happens to you that really freaks you out and you don't know how to process it and now you're not able to talk about it with anyone because you know that they're gonna laugh at you, they're gonna look at you like you're crazy, uh, alien abduction, what's wrong with you? This fear of ridicule encourages people not to report their cases. I check my audiences and I say, uh, how many people here believe they've seen what I would describe as a flying saucer? And the hands go up at first like this, you know. <laughs> And I point and count, one, two, three, four. By the time I get over there, the hands go up vigorously. 10% of the people in my audiences believe they've seen one. That's a lot. Most of them think they're the only ones there, you know. But then I ask, how many of you reported what you saw? 90% of the hands go down. So that's what we're dealing with. We don't get access to data because people are fearful of ridicule because even though they're believers, they think somebody else, everybody else isn't. I've got a younger brother that, that is really smart. And he, he's a, he works for a college in New York. And he doesn't understand why they pick people like us instead of people like him. You know what I mean? Why would they come to somebody that's, that's a red... I don't want to say that word on camera. Redneck? Yeah. Yeah, you can say redneck. <laughs> a redneck instead of us educated people. There is some fear, and I think fear is, a, is a, a basis of this, but solely when people don't understand something, it's a natural human tendency to mock. Songs were written about Travis, various forms of ridicule, and I think that if, if, if he would tell you was almost, or if not harder, than everything that happened in those few short days that he was gone. From a psychological perspective, I can't imagine what it would have been like for a young 22-year-old man working out with a logging crew in the woods to have undergone this radically life-changing event. It's a net negative, you know? We lost our jobs in the immediate aftermath of it. And I'm, uh, you know, definitely got the feeling that, you know, of many opportunities that I had in life were forever closed to me on account of having had this happen. He decides to stay in Snowflake. Everyone knows who he is, what happened to him. And from then on, he's labeled and identified um, in everything that he does, every job that he goes and gets, um, every, every friend and association. So you can imagine his whole self-identity is now related to this abduction. There were times over the years where I thought, you know, if I could just get this off my back any way I could, not just clam up, but just tell them, oh yeah, we were all drunk that day, you know? Even though it's a lame and silly thing to say, and it wouldn't fit with any of the facts, 
the people who were so anxious to hear something like that would latch on to it and leave us alone. But I never did it. He was somebody I looked up to because he had the courage to um, speak about this. And my sense hearing him speak was that Travis was not comfortable. He was not having a good time. He felt a sense of responsibility that he had to do this because it was important and because it was true. <clears throat> we all have choices. Travis, in my opinion, <clears throat> made the right choice. He came forward. I give him an A-plus rating, if you will, for integrity, uh, for intelligence, for aplomb, being able to handle himself under fire. Uh, how he could put up with some of the debunkers, I don't know, because they're nasty. Uh, I'm not sure I would be able to. Travis has withstood that for most of his life now, and as have the other participants in this, and they have all maintained the truthfulness of their story without embellishment all the way through to the present day. I admire him and Mike for all the time. I mean, it, I got away from it, you know. I, I moved to a place where nobody knew me. And Mike and Travis, you know, they, they stood there and, and just kept telling the truth, you know what I mean? And stood up there, you know, like all of us should have done, I guess. You're just one of those people. Travis became kind of the poster child for for people who have had similar experiences. It allowed them to, to see somebody who's overcome the, the, the most uh, intense ridicule and focus that you can in the public eye and to come out and stand back up and say, look, I did question everything that I kind of knew about you know, who I was and, and how I fit into the universe, but I put it back together and I'm okay with it. And now, now Steve's doing quite a bit, I guess. What changed my feelings? Yeah, because you said you hated Travis for a while after this happened. Um, <laughs> we're on tape here, dude. <laughs> um, my wife and my kids, they told me, you know, you got to forgive Travis for what happened. You can't blame him for all this. And they believe that, you know, it's time to heal. You all have a story to tell and, and people should be, you know, should know about it. But if you don't come out and tell your story, somebody else is going to tell it for you. For me to see Travis continue to go out and to speak, um, to reach out to people when he could just kind of brush it aside and say, I don't want to be that guy anymore. I don't want to be known as the guy who was abducted. I just want to forget about it. But instead, he's embraced it. And, and that speaks very highly of him because if not to serve him, I think it's helped a lot of other people. He certainly rose to the occasion. He certainly rose to the occasion and has seemed to meet it every single step along the way. And that, for me, is a mark of fine, extraordinary character, decency, and everything that most good people should be aspiring to in living a, a decent, contributing life. There's a degree of responsibility to try to make something good come of it, you know? Uh, certainly, I have to accept the bad. So if I can direct what's happened in a way that I can make something good happen in the world, I'm looking for it. This was the road we, we took on our way to work every day. We'd all meet at like Mike's house. Sometimes he'd go around and pick everybody up. We'd uh, worked on the contract a great deal and much of it had already been cut, but uh, much of the uh, a lot of time had already elapsed, so we were we were under pressure on a deadline, and we'd extended our working hours to try to get it all done before the snow came. A lot of this drive looks the way it looked back then, but then there's other parts that have been changed by the Rodeo Chetuskai fire, which uh, burned up over half a million acres of uh, forest. At that time, it was the biggest uh, recorded uh, fire in Arizona history. We spent so many back-breaking hours improving this forest, and then to have all that work just go up in smoke because of just one little careless moment, you know, 100 miles from here. Turkey Springs contract is pretty much everything on our left, all the way over to that far ridge that's all burned off. And I think there's one more past that was the ridge where we were at that day. 
Keep an eye out for the wild horses. They like this area. Okay, turn right here on the left. We won't be able to drive all the way up to the site because it's all been closed. Okay. But we can walk there now. I'm struggling to come to terms with this and, and, and especially to try to understand or take some meaning, at least personal meaning. You know, after four decades, I've come to, uh, you know, a little different take than I had initially. I took it e extreme exception to what had happened, uh, you know, the fear, the horror of it all. It was only gradually did I just come to realize that they didn't just bring me aboard to do experiments on me or just torment me to see, you know, what what pain does to humans or something of that nature that that most likely uh, uh, you can infer that that with that amount of energy hitting me, it would have been probably fatal. And that they probably took me aboard in order to uh, revive me, to, to correct the damage. I don't blame you for, for doing. I don't blame Mike for e taking off either because he had all of us others to worry about yeah. too, you know? Yeah. And, you know, and if he would have went to my mom's house that night mm -hmm. and said that I was zapped by a UFO, my mom would have shot him off the porch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think they understood that I was getting too close in a way that was putting myself in great danger. They were trying to move the, the craft a little bit out of uh, range before I got myself uh, hurt and uh, it was too late. Uh, the energy had hit me and damage was done, possibly cardiac arrest or worse. And so these beings were in a position to where they could leave a body there or they had the responsibility being a part of this accident to do their best to try to bring me aboard and re revive me. My big theory about what it was all about, that it was a um, intentional display of the mythology of the phoenix. The death part of the display was, you know, him getting knocked to the ground like that and making some of the crew members even think he might be dead. Of course, so many other people during the five days he was gone thought that he was dead. Figurative rebirth is when they dropped him off right outside of Heber here. I tried to convince myself that Travis actually was killed, but they picked him up to fix him up, you know. So it had a, a happy ending to it, <laughs> you know what I mean? They didn't just pick him up to mess with him, they picked him up to help him. I'm actually, you know, fortunate if that was the case that they did so because the nearest hospital was over an hour away and none of the crew knew CPR or anything like that. When you hit the ground, you, you I mean, you went funk, you know, and... Lamp, huh? Yeah, you went, to you bounced, and then you hit the ground. When I finally uh, came to rest, was I face up or face down? He was like this. Dead man, huh? Yeah. We saw something go across the sky. Yeah. You know, so we thought it was gone. Yeah, so... So we were know, more worried about coming it, back and seeing you lying there dead. Charcoal. Huh? Yes, there's be nothing left of you. And that's, that was our biggest fear that... You see the process of this, of this person who was once a very young man, who's now more mature and has had time to reflect on this over his life. And he's still, uh, you really get the sense that he is still trying to process this. What happened to me? Will I ever get closure on it? I really believe that it was done on purpose and you know, someday we're gonna find, find out why. First time I came out here to camp, it was restricted. I'll, nobody was, you know, soon after the fire, nobody's supposed to be here, but. You, did you feel any fear at night? No. Not, I, not even about bears or anything like that? No, I was actually in the back of my truck and the camper. Oh, pretty safe. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't camping out on the ground. But... Did you like stay up late at night? No, actually just... I was drinking. Drinking a little, little bit when I guess, <laughs> I guess that helped me through it. Huh? Oh, I don't. I didn't know you'd ever be a drinker. <laughs> that must have been a phase you were going through, huh? Yeah. There have been several times in the last 40 years I've thought it would just fade off, you know, like things do, but it hasn't. It's been just the reverse. Uh, Travis's name is just known internationally, and uh, my name isn't, I think, but it's in association. <laughs>
Some of the crew have intimated that they kind of wish that it happened to them. I think, you know, some of it's based on, you know, a kind of a, a wistful desire to have the kind of insight that I've gained from having this experience. Some of it may be even connected with, you know, the attention that came my way. I'd certainly be happier without it. I've, I've responded, you know, guys, you know, you would not want this to happen to you. I wouldn't wish it off on anybody other than some UFO skeptics. Uh, they, they would be served well by having have it happen to them. When you did come, did it refresh your memory? Did it like bring those, the feeling that we had back then? Yeah, it's, uh, but it's kind of a, kind of an invigorating type of thing. It's uh, times of emotion, you know, you get, little bit of the bad memories of it, parts of it, but it's just a special spot for me. I mean, what, what an experience. <laughs> you know, the skeptics who say, why, if they're really coming here, don't they just land on the White House lawn? Well, they're not going with open contact, and they're not going with uh, total cloaking. So what's going on? I think a conditioning process. I get email after email, people saying, give me the GPS coordinates. And I'm not giving that to nobody except I'm in there. Here, here a big concern was, you know, fire, them starting a fire and burning the place down. It's happened naturally. <laughs> well, that was one concern. I was concerned that people would cut up the trees for souvenirs and then, then there'd be nothing to do research on or even people doing something to try to, you know, cast doubt on things. We're being gradually conditioned in a way that's the least destructive possible. So I think, you know, in a way, by talking about this, I'm playing a part in that, uh, that people need to come to that realization in a way that they can handle. When you look at the Travis Walton case, it really is a situation of the more you look, the more you find. It's been 40 years now. You've got a very credible subject, and Travis Walton. You've got six credible witnesses. You have a situation where the debunkers have tried to throw this out and they've failed every single time. It's, uh, it's stood the test of time. And it was just right at the top of the rise. Kind of in the saddle. In the saddle of these two hills coming down. Yeah, it's got to be right in here someplace. Definitely the spot, Travis. Yeah. So Ken, how does it feel 38 years <laughs> later, the first time you and Travis in the back? Yeah, I think we, he deserves a hug on this day. <laughs> 38 years, we had that tremendous experience. It's just, you know, the other day I, I was talking about this and I said 28 years and the Everybody hastened to remind me, no, it was 38 years. Oh, oh. You know, it's just incredible to think that that much time has gone by. Yeah. I tell people, in spite of the fact that I've come to terms with it better and realized that it wasn't as malevolent as I uh, at first thought it was, that even now, I'd rather it never happened, you know? Travis, uh, what would you like for your future? What would you like to have come of this? Just uh, acceptance of myself in the future. I uh, have had a lot of offers that, of people trying to turn it into some kind of a profitable thing, but I have no interest in any of those kind of offers. I just want the truth to be known. I have intentions to cooperate with um, research with uh, reputable men that are, you know, genuinely scientifically interested. Do you wish it had never happened to you? Well, hindsight, I don't know. What happened, happened.